and we have a, a lot of questions to, to think uh, about. So, any question to Johannes Heidi Selassie? Yes, 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 yes. Yeah. Adam Siget. So, thank you, Johannes, for the uh, wonderful presentation. I think when you look at what you're telling us, it confirms what I think is the rule rather than the exception. That is, just recently, we had homo sapiens, homo neanderthalensis, homo maybe Denisovans, homo fluorescences, you know, roaming the uh, landscape at the same time, more or less. And when you go deep in time, you look at the sewage and bobbits, you know how diverse they are. So to just say that I'm glad that you are bringing more data to substantiate that there was indeed diversity in the Pliocene, indeed pl pl Pleistocene, and uh, uh, show that uh, hominins are behaving the same way as other species. So I just would like to thank you for the new information. Thank you for your excellent talk. Um, continuing on the, the remarks by uh, Dr. Alam Seged, uh, I would just like to highlight that um, regarding, if I can compare Pleistocene or Middle Pleistocene diversity with Middle Pleistocene uh, diversity, I think the, the big change in the last uh, couple of years is that uh, we used to think that the, the diversity we observe in, um, in, the, in, the, in the Pleistocene, in the middle Pleistocene, for example, is, is mainly resulting from geographical segregation. So all the groups you mentioned, the Neanderthals, the Denisovans, the Floresiensis, now Lusonensis, uh, Homo sapiens, etc., were basically uh, groups devolving and uh, developing and evolving in different continental areas or islands. And, and really the new things with, with Naledi and uh, maybe with what I shall explain tomorrow uh, is that what we see now is that even in the same regions uh, we can have in the place to see uh, different groups evolving for significant lengths of time. And this is absolutely puzzling because to what extent we can, uh, I would say, apply a model of, I don't know, diet uh, adaptation to explain the difference between these groups or what kind of niche they had. I think this is absolutely puzzling. I think is, is the big challenge we're facing uh, in human evolution, uh, evolutionary studies. Thank you. Any answer, Johannes? No. I think I, I agree with Bo's comments. The diversity issue is something that has been there and will always be there. It doesn't have to be like time specific because there I mentioned that there is diversity in almost every mammalian taxa that we know, uh, and th there shouldn't be any reason why we wouldn't expect diversity in the human lineage too. So, but what makes it really significant, particularly the middle Pliocene um, diversity is because I think that's where the origin of the genus Homo itself lies. And because we have so many species, the big challenge is figuring out which one of this is the ancestor of our lineage. And that's, that's why I think the middle Pliocene is really significant, because we have diversity during the Pleistocene, but Homo has already evolved at that time. Now, going back in time, who is the real ancestor? Who is the ancestor of the genus Homo is, I think, one of the key questions that we need to answer. And in my opinion, the middle Pliocene is going to give us the answer to that. And the more, whether we identify more diversity or um, refine our understanding of this hominins that have already been discovered and somehow create the best link to our lineage, that's the key, the key question that we're going to have to tackle. Otherwise, the diversity, as you said, yeah, it was all, all the time we had diversity. We've seen diversity at different times. Just remaining with the genus Homo, uh, and I don't want to 
return to the single species hypothesis, but uh, it's unbelievable. I mean, uh, how, you know, every, everything we can say today can be turned down tomorrow with new discoveries because uh, even within recent hominids, we find a level of diversity that were, was never envisioned uh, even by my generation, which is not so old. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Well, it's very impressive, this, this uh, diversity anyway. It uh, looks like the, the, the diversity we were talking about this morning with uh, Brigitte and, and uh, Michel, Michel Brunet and Brigitte uh, Senu. It's, it's really fantastic. What, what a number of, of, of people, what a number of species, maybe species, maybe, maybe true species or not. At, 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 the, at that time. And uh, we, Brigitte. Thanks, Johannes, for your talk. Uh, I'm still puzzled about this high diversity. I don't, I have no problem with diversity of hominoids in the past, or hominids in the past, not a problem. But so many different species of the same place. What kind of environment have you got? And do, did they eat more or less the same thing or not? Because then you have a big competition. Nowadays, we know in, in Central Africa, for example, where I'm working, you can find chimpanzees, gorillas, and, uh, and humans. That's fine. They are very different in their behavior, in their feeling adaptations, in their locomotion. But for, for your different species, what would be the main difference to have a different ecological niches and what kind of environment they would be living in? If you have some smell about it. <laughs> Thank you. Well, we've, we've done some preliminary studies on the paleoecological reconstruction uh, at the places where we have our friends and also where we have the Bortelli food and our South Africa State Remeda. And what we're seeing is there was always diversity in terms of the habitat. Not like a, no specific habitat was dominant in any of the sites that we have. So our hypothesis is the, the, the site where Bortelli food was found was probably more wooded than the other one. And that's the evidence that we have from uh, ISOP data. But w we still need to refine this uh, uh, preliminary results based on a lot of other uh, techniques, which we were actually adding a lot more uh, new techniques to the analysis. But we don't, we don't sample a lot of open habitats in these localities where we found Australopithecus uh, stay Ramada and the Portelli foot as much as the open habitats that we're sampling from the sites where we have, actually the earlier sites, where we have uh, Australopithecus afrensis and Australopithecus anamensis. So it's really interesting. That's like a good starting point to actually understand what there really habitat difference between the older sites that we have at 3.6 to 3.8 and the slightly younger ones that we have from the 3.5 to 3 million years where we have this multiple species. So there, was there any change in terms of the habitat? That could also be a, mm -hmm. a driving factor mm -hmm. for the diversity. So that's what we're actively working on now. Okay. Uh, in terms of forest, because fructification in this, it's a tropical time period, you know, um, environment. But you wouldn't get fructification all year long. You have to move with the fructification, with fruit and so on. And you wouldn't be feeling all the time in the same place. You have to move. So if you have one or two species, that's fine. But to get four species, it becomes a little bit difficult to do that at the same time. The, I mean, the competition might have been very strong, or you have less species. This is with, with my answer. But I may be wrong. But, but thank you. <laughs> much for your presentation. Um, I have a question about, um, I'm very convinced that there is a, from your data, that there is a diversity in the mid Pliocene of East Africa and also in the late Pliocene of South Africa. But a question that uh, comes to my mind is, uh, which kind of features would you consider to try to establish links, phylogenetically speaking, between these two diversities? In other, in other terms, which feature would you consider as the best candidates to try to connect the two lineages in the mid Pliocene of East Africa with possibly two lineages of Australopithecus seen in, uh, in South Africa? Which features? Enamel thickness or which one would you consider as the best ones? 
That's, that's a very interesting question, because this is one of the um, challenges that we've had for many, many decades now. How do we connect the East African hominins with the South African hominins? Now, traditionally, people have suggested that Africanus descended from Australopithecus afarensis because that was the only, the oldest species that we have in, in we had in, in our evolutionary history. But speaking like about the relationships right now, and if you ask me about like morphological similarities, the one thing that I can tell you is the Bortelli foot, when we analyzed that um, uh, specimen, we saw some similarities in the morphology of the second digit between Bortelli foot and a specimen we call STW89 from um, South Africa. So could that be used as a link between the South African forms and the East African forms? Maybe, but we've also used craniodental characters to actually diagnose species or connect species together. So since the Bortelli foot didn't have any associated craniodental material, we cannot really be sure that the, the evidence that we're seeing in terms of similarity in the foot morphology actually links those two. But it's, it's very possible that some of the uh, middle Pliocene hominids that we're finding from Moranzo Mille might in fact connect the South African forums into Eastern African um, hominids through time, but that's like a, a work under, uh, under study right now. But there is a possibility, yes. Thank you. Are there more questions? Well, thank you very much, uh, Johannes. Brigitte? <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Johannes. It was very, very interesting and a uh, lot of questions uh, again, which is, which is good. And congratulations for you, your work in AFO. Uh, now we, we will have a, a short ceremony which is uh, very uh, unusual, but very, very nice, you will see. And I'm calling first uh, uh, Professor Thackeray, Professor Francis Thackeray from South Africa for, for coming here. Please. Australopithecus Africanus by Professor Raymond Dart from the University of the Witwatersrand, where I'm based. And he called it Australopithecus Africanus, the ape-like creature from Africa, confirming that it was from Africa that we had the first human ancestors. So this is for you. As a token of appreciation, I have one request. Please could you show it to His Holiness Pope Francis? I, I, let me first thank you very much. I feel very attached to my ancestor, holding <laughs> her here in my hands. And uh, I will encourage uh, our Chancellor uh, to show it uh, to the Holy Father uh, when giving a report about this uh, very important workshop. Um, thank you very much. And this will, f uh, she will find, she or he will find a home here in the meeting room of um, our council right uh, here in this building. Thank you very much. Thank you. And there is something that I would like Professor Jose Braga to give to your chancellor. Well, no, please, you explain. So this book was released uh, recently, and uh, it reports some discoveries uh, uh, made on a very famous site in South Africa, and I will explain more about that this afternoon. So this is it. Thank you very much. Thank you. I am very happy, and I'll show to the Pope. It's, together with the historical.
copy. Thank you. Nothing for me. Yeah, for <laughs> 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 yeah. That's fine. So, it's not finished, it's not finished. There is, uh, Monsieur le Chancelier, Monseigneur, and, and Monsieur le Président, there is a, a second gift from uh, a Moroccan friend, an architect, who did a, a beautiful big book, very big book, on uh, prehistory and paleontology of Morocco, and who want to, to give you his, his book, which is... Uh, well, more than the dictionary. You will see how thick and how heavy is the gift. And th th this will be given in French, I guess. Sorry, he has to go to Morocco to get, uh, to get the book. <coughs> ah, that's the one. En français, mais en français. I speak uh, French. Français, oui, oui. Sorry. Euh, donc, je, je remets ce, ce, mon livre, le, le, le premier exemple à sa sainteté. Alors, c'est un livre qui, qui parle, euh, c'est-à-dire, euh, qui parle que du Maroc, euh, témoin de l'évolution de la tombe à la culture. Donc, il traite les les, les épisodes d'évolution ou la chronologie d'évolution de l'univers à la terre, de la terre à la vie et de la vie à l'homme. Et à peu près, c'est-à-dire euh, à l'homme, c'est ce le, le sujet de, du colloque de ces deux jours-là. Donc il y avait d'autres colloques où il y avait la paléontologie, et il y a d'autres collègues à, à lesquels j'ai assisté, où il y avait sur l'univers, par exemple sur les météorites, la découverte des météorites, etc. Et puis dans le livre, j'ai mis, parce que nous avons une, une, une éminente chercheure sur, de météorites, donc j'ai expliqué, présenté ces recherches. Et donc, euh, c'est donc un livre qui trace la chronologie de, de la tombe à l'homme. Voilà. Je suis... Comme vous savez, les papes étaient à Maroc. Récentement, les papes étaient à Maroc. Oui, Alors, ça, ça a bien intéressé d'avoir cette histoire. Je, je, je l'ai mis à, au nom de sa sainteté avec une une lettre de transmission pour vous et c'est la lettre euh, adressée à sa sainteté pour lui offrir ce livre là Merci. voilà Merci. je suis ravi je, je je et je suis ravi de l'offrir euh, devant les, les éminents chercheurs que j'ai connus euh, même, que je les, même si je ne les ai pas vus mais en étudiant le livre je les ai connus comme Hila Silassi comme euh, Alemis, Alemis, euh, le, 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 cherche, le découvreur de Kika, de Salem, euh, je, euh, professeur Brunet, il y a beaucoup de chercheurs que j'ai connus ici, pas physiquement, mais par leur découverte, et, et que j'ai abordé au cours de l'élaboration de ce livre-là. Merci, je suis bien content, hein. spécialement parce que vous venez de ce pays. Alors, ça, c'est bien important aussi. Et donc, euh, le, toutes les découvertes, j'ai un petit peu euh, favorisé, ou plutôt euh, mis en valeur, les découvertes qui ont été euh, faites au Maroc. Et on peut dire que le Maroc, c'est le sol de, où se croisaient les, les preuves de la vie, même de l'univers, et même de, de la, la paléontologie, et même de l'homme. Et M. Jean-Jacques Hublin en est absolument témoin. Il a beaucoup travaillé, dont j'ai beaucoup mis, euh, c'est-à-dire ce qu'il a fait, découvert ici. Il a fait un excellent travail, et un long travail, et il continue toujours. Et il y a, je ne dois pas oublier Jean euh, Reynal aussi, 
qui a travaillé parallèlement avec Jean-Jacques Hublin. Il y a beaucoup de, de scientifiques qui m'ont, malgré que je, je ne suis pas scientifique, je suis architecte, je suis passionné, c'est tout euh, passionné, et la passion parfois l'emporte sur la profession. Euh, donc, euh, je, je remercie tout le monde, c'est-à-dire tous les scientifiques qui m'ont poussé euh, pour faire ce travail. Et surtout, derrière moi, pendant très longtemps, le professeur Yves Coppens. Voilà. Merci beaucoup. Euh, J'aime bien le Maroc. Euh, Alpha Shokra. Merci. Je suis ravi de, de cette journée-là. Merci. Merci. Merci beaucoup. Et bien après tous ces cadeaux, after all these gifts, uh, I wish you a very good appetite. And we stop for lunch during what one 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 hour and a half or something like that. Okay. Thank you very much.